Hello everyone, it's Ryan again. I'm back with another ISET video. Um, and so the last video I put out was almost two months ago, was on quantitative reasoning, and I went through some questions um just to give everyone um some sense of like what um the strategies are for specific types of quantitative reasoning questions. And in this lesson, or rather of this recording, what I want to do is I want to go over some actual ISIP questions. Um, most of it would be on quantitative as well, but I will also put a specific type of probably the most painful type of critical reasoning question, which is quotes analysis. Um, in this video, I want to go through some of them. And just to give you an idea of how I would approach those questions, and hopefully that would give you some insight into um, maybe um, ways or methods you can use um, in order to improve your accuracy and your speed when you do those types of questions. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Um, so this is the official ACER practice test you can purchase from the ACER website. So I would highly recommend everyone to purchase this official ACE practice um, just to do um, maybe at the start of your preparation to know what your levels are and then you can always come back to it to redo the mistake questions to think about um, how you can improve. Um, so today, the first question is the one that I want to focus on. And this is a very, I wouldn't say easy, but it's a quite straightforward type of quantitative reasoning questions. Um, this is what you see in the ISET. They give you some kind of information. Um, most likely, it's something that you have never heard of, right? In this case, we're dealing with cars passing on a highway, and they measure, like, the car density and um, carrying capacity like that. And they also provide you with a graph looking like this. So what is the best way to approach this type of questions? Um, the way I think about quantitative is that it has two parts, right? The first part is figures. So figures can be um, in numbers, and it can also be in graphs, so looking like this. And the second, probably more important thing, um, is units, all right, units. Um, so by just by looking at the units, we can instantly know uh, where to find the key information. They, they are like um, basically a sign telling you where to find those information and how you can obtain the correct answer um, in a very short period of time. So looking at this question, feel free to pause this video and just read through the background information for this question first. And then I will go through the question using my strategies. Assuming everyone has um, had a read of this background information, I'm going to dive into this question using my way. Looking at this graph, the first thing that pops into my mind um, is, you know, the shape of this graph being a inverse parabola um, and also the axes. The axes are the more important thing. So looking at the axes, we see two keywords. The first one being vehicle density. Um, and the second one being volume. But more importantly, we look at the units. So knowing these information, we can dive into the questions and really see what the question is asking us to find. The first question, um, question one, states, which of the following is defined by the statement, the maximum number of cars passing a point on a single lane highway per hour? So what's the key information to extract from this this the sentence two things the first is maximum all right the first thing is maximum so it has to be something maximum and also another information that's important is the units the units here being um number of cars per hour so cars per hour so that sounds very familiar to us right because we know by looking at this graph was cars per hour cost per hour is volume, okay? But is volume the maximum? Because on this graph, the maximum is obviously over here, right? But is it called the maximum volume? Um, In the answer options, we cannot see the phrase maximum volume. So there must be another phrase to describe something like a maximum volume. And by looking back to the background information, we can see what's maximum volume. It's right over here. And Another phrase to describe that is carrying capacity. 
So that's how we get the answer for the first question. So there's no interpretation, but rather just looking at the units. Um, so that's why I said two pieces of information are important. First, the figures, the numbers, right? You are doing calculations with them. Um, but sometimes it's not the case. You don't even need those numbers. What you need is just the units. And in, that's the case over here. We don't need the, um, the numbers, but rather just by looking at the units, we can get the correct answer. Right, going into the next question is another one I want to go through in this set is question two. Question two states, as the number of cars passing a point on the road each hour increases from zero, the average speed of cars and something. And we're given four options. So looking at the sentence, what's the most important piece of information we pick up is still the units. Um, number of cars each hour. So what's that alluding to? That's still alluding to the volume. So that is still alluding to the volume. So basically, if we go back to the graph, we see um, volume, it's basically saying as volume increases from zero, um, how does the speed change? But we don't know the speed just by looking at this graph because this graph only tells us the relationship between volume and vehicle density. But just looking at this graph, we know it has a directly proportional relationship, right? As volume increases from zero, uh, what happens with vehicle density? That also increases from zero as well. But something changes after we reach the turning point or the maximum volume or the carrying capacity, as you, you probably remember from the first question, um, is that it becomes an inversely direct, uh, inversely um, proportional relationship, right? Um, so as we um, volume increases, but vehicle density decreases. Now we just need to find a missing link. There's no extra information given to us in this graph. So where do we find that information? We go back to the additional information. Okay, going back to that additional information, um, we can see the third bot dot point says, on average, cars move at the speed limit until carrying capacity has been reached. And what's carrying capacity again? It's the maximum volume. So that is the link. Rather, it's not the link between vehicle density and speed, but that's the link between directly, even better, between volume and speed. So basically saying, before we reach the maximum volume, they all move at the speed limits. And then as the volume increases, it's going to decrease, right? Because it says um, when carrying capacity is reached, cars must move more slowly at higher capacity. So if I were to draw a graph um, on the horizontal axis, let's just say volume. On the vertical axis, let's just say speed. What's this graph going to look like? We know before volume or maximum volume, let's just say this point over here, before maximum volume is reached, what happens with speed? Speed remains constant. And then after that, it slowly decreases. So it's probably something like this. So constant first and then slowly decrease. Then what is the option that's telling us this information we just drew on the graph? It's D, right? Remains constant and then decreases. So that's how we get the answer. All right, that is it for quantitative reasoning. That's all I want to talk about for that question. Um, and, you know, you can feel free to purchase this from the ACE website. I don't think they're too expensive. So you can go through all these questions in your own time uh, at your own pace. Going forward, we're going into the realm of critical reasoning. And I personally, I feel like critical reasoning is probably more difficult for me and maybe for the majority of um non-native English speakers, um, because there's lots of reading, lots of interpretation, and sometimes even literature being involved. And that is the case over here, which is what I described the most pain in the ass type of question is quotes analysis. Quotes analysis, they give you quotes like this and you have no idea what they mean. What I want to focus on today is a more generic and more um, broad strategy that you can apply for the majority of the quotes analysis questions is that we really look at two things when we think about a quote. The first thing is what I call the subject. And the second thing is what I call the attitude. 
So what, what does that mean? What's the subject? What's the attitude? The subject is essentially what the quote is focusing on. So what specific topic, what specific, a specific thing, um, and in this case, we can see the subject is mostly time, right? Mostly time. And the second one is the attitude. So how does, what is the author's attitude basically towards that subject? Sometimes it can be positive. Sometimes it can be negative. Sometimes it can be neutral. So that's the main three kind of attitudes we can identify pretty easily. Is it positive, negative, or neutral, right? Positive, negative, or neutral. And I want to go through two questions here just to illustrate my point. <clears throat> so going to the first question, question 32, is when I want to apply, you know, the, the sense of attitude and subject in this quote. Um, statement one says, you talk of the sort of time and the tooth of time, but I tell you time is toothless and has no blade. It is we who chew like worms and strike like the sword. So what's the subject here? It's basically a what? A time, right? Time. But rather than just focusing on time being such a broad sense, what's a more specific definition we can give for the subject? It's time. And what else? And us, right? It's time and humans. It's a comparison between time versus humans. And so we now identified the subject was the author's attitude. The author's attitude is basically saying what? We think time has tooth, time is a sword, but I tell you time is toothless, all right? It's we, humans, strike like the sword. So what is the feeling the author is trying to convey? Is it we? is greater than time or is time is greater than us so by reading this quote you can probably tell the author is trying to convey we or humans are better than time or greater than time in some sort of sense right so that's the strategy i want to give to us is basically we identify the subject time versus humans and what's the author's attitude positive negative or neutral and here the author the author holds a rather negative attitude towards um towards time. Rather thinking about it is, you know, we think about it as, as strong or ruthless, but rather it's us humans being strong, ruthless, or like the sword. So if I were to summarize it, it's probably just something very simple. Humans greater than time. Humans greater than time. So that tells me the attitude and also the subjects. And just by knowing this, I can just get the answer for question 32. Um, statement one suggests that A, time is inevitably destructive. B, time gives life and takes it away. C, humans, not time, are the great destroyers. D, the march of time is inevitable and all force before it. So which sentence over here conveys a sense that we humans are more destructive or ruthless than time? It's C, right? So it's quite simple. We can tell it's C because the other options are basically saying time is ruthless, time is destructive, but rather what the quote is saying is humans greater than time. Um, so as you can see, I'm illustrated in this example. Most of the time, we don't need to know what the quote is actually saying. Um, we just need to identify those two key elements and we can just use process of elimination to get the correct answer. And I think that's particularly useful for um, second language speakers um, because sometimes the literature um, of those quotes are just too complicated to comprehend. And going to the next question, question 33, is the second point I want to make, is that for quotes questions, there are sometimes you can just get the my idea. The main idea is explicitly stated in that quote. And where do we find them? They're usually in the first or in the last sentence of that quote. So the first or the last sentence of the quote usually would give you the main idea if the author is kind enough to tell you what the main idea is. And that is the case for question 32. Three, right? Statement two is an invitation to imagine. So what's what's there to imagine? Um, so we have to go back to statement two and looking at statement two, let's have a read. 
Think that you are not yet born. Think that you are young, you are old, that you are dead, that you are in the world beyond grave. Okay, there's lots of thinking. Um, grasp all that in your thoughts at once, all times and places. The last sentence of that quote sounds like an invitation for us to do what? To grasp or to hold everything, all the thoughts, all the old, the young, the, the dead, the born, right? Everything at all times and all places at once. So what does that sound like? Just by looking at these options. That sounds like a paraphrase of holding everything in the mind at once, right? So that's the case where the author is kind enough just to tell us explicitly what the mind is, what the author wants us to do, wants us to think, wants us to comprehend. And, you know, it's good for us because we're just looking at the last sentence. We can get, okay, statement two is an invitation to imagine holding everything in the mind at once. So these quotes are quite nice because you just read the first or the last sentence. In this case, it's the last sentence and that tells you the main idea. So that concludes the general or like the broad strategy for quotes analysis questions. Just to review two points we wanna think about. The first one is we think about the subject and the attitude, right? We try to ident identify those um, because identifying those are easier um, than just comprehending or understanding uh, what the quote actually means. And the second point is that uh, if the author is nice, we can find the main idea in the first or the last sentence. So hopefully when uni starts that I don't get too busy, I'll put out another video. But I think in the future, I will move slowly move towards writing blogs on my website. Uh, the website is medict.com. It's a website that's made by me and a couple of um, medical student friends. Um, has some interview and MMI and ISET resources on there. You can feel free to check it out. Um, but also I will regularly update the blog section on the website. So all that information will be written and it's better just for absorption. And um, I think reading is probably a better way to, um, to remember that information and take notes uh, if any of the information is proven to be helpful. Um, that's it. That's all I want to talk about today. And really thank you for watching.